very good. Welcome. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, my name is Jimmy. Happy to be with you guys. Um, I started in dentistry in 1979. I know it's hard to, to believe that. I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, but I did start young and I started, we were a small lab. There were only about eight of us and uh, we grew. Uh, we were very blessed. We grew to 135 in three locations. And while I started on the bench, most of my career, just after a few years, was spent in the field working with customers, work, working with docs like you. I spent thousands of cases chairside doing consults and assists on uh, cosmetic cases and implant cases. Um, I presented over 50 times a year to study clubs, dental meetings, and um, also at uh, two universities. I was a, a uh, part-time faculty at two dental schools teaching residents and, and undergrad students. And all that's just to say, it gave me a lot of experience to see a lot of different cases and the way things work and didn't work. And so that's what today's all about, is just to share that kind of experience and information with you. And uh, hopefully you'll find a thing or two that you can use. I, I'm pretty excited about this topic. I, I really uh, think that removable dentistry has really uh, resurfaced as a, an exciting uh, part of our field and uh, with the digital uh, integration that we're seeing and of course implants are, are pretty awesome as well so it's nice to be able to merge these things together so if you see me looking that way I'm looking at my topics but I'm also looking at the uh, questions in chat so uh, let's just uh, move right into it so We'll start with some trends, right? We'll talk about where we are. We're looking at, of course, uh, an all on uh, X restoration and then the bottom pictures are kind of an image of digital, right? We see a denture on a computer screen and then we see the actual denture and that's kind of where we are today, right? Uh, uh, there's still a lot of things done traditionally though. You still see a lot of labs using wax and teeth and stone to fabricate dentures and partials, but we're moving more and more into the digital space. You see more techs using uh, computer softwares to design partial frames or design dentures and then mill or print those things out. When I talk about digital dentistry and dentures, I usually get questions from dentists pretty quickly about, oh, okay, tell me about that. How can I do a digital denture? Well, unfortunately, for the most part, uh, on the clinical side, uh, when a dentist wants to do a digital denture, he still has to do pretty much traditional methods, right? Still has to take an impression, still has to take a bite. Uh, those records are what the labs use to digitize, digitize the process, right? So we take a, a traditional impression, pour the model, put the model in a scanner, and then digitize uh, that art so that we can set the teeth virtually. It's coming around though, it really is. We're starting to see more and more changes on the clinical side right, on digital impressions. This is uh, images that I love looking at because it excites me about where we are with digital technology. I was um, also a, a clinical trainer for four different digital impression uh, systems. So I've seen a lot of them uh, get installed in offices. I've seen a lot of uh, dentists and staff learn how to work with these devices. But until the last year, I was not able to see any of them that could scan uh, edentulist tissue really well. Uh, but this past year, uh, with the introduction of PrimeScan from Dents Plus Serona and the uh, Trios 4 from 3Shape, we're starting to see some really good scans intraorally uh, using a digital impression. So it's being validated now. More folks are talking about it and testing it. We don't have a true validated workflow for scanning and edentulous arts for dentures yet, but we're doing lots of things in the testing and validation phase, and I'm excited about where we'll be a year from now. I really like the new technology and the way the uh, cameras and the software is working to uh, not necessarily be looking for a tooth all the time. That's been the issue in the past. So. Pretty excited about the accuracy of these devices we see. This was a recent study that Dr. Wally Renee, who was one of the leading educators in the world on digital impression technology, he heads up the program at uh, 
Medical University of South Carolina School of Dentistry, and he oversees all the students in the student clinic and their integration of digital uh, impressions. And all the undergrad students, as they start in the student clinic, they have to use a digital impression device. So it's exciting to see that we're going in that area, and as, as students grow graduate and come out into the field with us and they've all had good experience and we see accuracy just getting better and better. And so that excites me a lot to be able to look at scans like this and, and think as a lab guy, you know, I could probably make a denture fit that pretty good digitally. So that's where we're headed. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes the patients come back for adjustments a lot, right? And so here's a guy who's I think the dentist has said, look, you, you do it. It's 10 times. I think it's time for you to make the adjustments yourself. And that's comical, but it's true. And that, that patients do uh, come back for tiny little high spots. And um, what we hope that digital dentures do for us, right, is to minimize that. And, and I believe it will. I truly do. I think digital dentures give us some advantages that we haven't had in the past, if we think about it, right? And regardless of how the digital denture is made, we have something we call CAD CAM fit, and, and that's a big difference than the way we've done dentures in the past. You know, traditionally, you, you take an impression out of alginate or polyether, polyvinyl, send it to the lab. The lab pours stone in that. From that stone, they'll put wax on that stone. Uh, then they'll take that and put it in a boil out unit and dry it off and then mix up acrylic and press into that mold. And there's a lot of moving pieces there where things could shrink can expand and not fit. With a CAD CAM process, we take out several of those steps, right? We take either a stone model and scan it and fabricate the denture virtually from that model. So it's a true one-to-one -one fit. There is no investing or packing or waxing or acrylic, right? So it's going to be a better fitting restoration regardless. A cool thing for you and for your patients is that the digital record remains on file, right? So if the patient calls back the, the second day after you delivered it and said the dog chewed it up, no problem. You call the lab and they can pull the file up and uh, reprint the denture, remail the denture pretty easily. All this results in you know, fewer appointment steps and fewer adjustments for you and you know, patients are happier and it is a more consistent product. So I, I'm truly excited about CAD CAM dentures. I think they're really gonna change the way we look at uh, uh, full large dentureless restorations. So if we're in the digital space and we create a denture virtually, right, we have to turn it back into an analog version so the patient can wear it. You know, how are we doing that? You know, up until um, about three years ago, the, the standard for that step was a mill denture and it was a good solution. The, uh, the pucks were materials we're familiar with, right? It's a Lucitone 199 puck. Uh, acrylic we've used forever and ever, but somebody took the time to put it in a machine and form a puck that we could mill the denture out of. And so that helped us a little bit, right? No investing in packing. Uh, all the free monomers were totally cured up, compressed really hot, so no bubbles. So it was a good solution. Um, and, and labs embrace that. I embrace that in my lab. But the, the problem with, and you look at this, this is about 10 or 12 days worth of milling time because it takes about three to four hours to mill a denture out of a puck. So productively, it's, it's not effective. Uh, uh, dentists and patients have to wait a little longer. Uh, labs have to figure out how to either buy enough milling machines to make it productively effective, which is not cost effective at all. So it, it was a good solution for a, a high-end uh, digital denture as a way for us to get into this space. But about three years ago, we started seeing uh, printed dentures come on the market, right? And we call, I call these generation one materials. And so the first generation of materials were in certain printers and by certain manufacturers, just bottles of material you could pour into a 3D printer and you could print a base. Uh, you could print teeth and you could glue the two together and you'd have a pretty good solution. You still got the benefits of the CAD CAM fit. Now, what was missing was that the materials had not advanced enough to be matched to what we've been used to doing, right? Uh, we, we were used to Lucitone 199 and the aesthetics and strength of that. So we were seeing materials that were certainly not near as strong as what we were familiar with and, and not as aesthetic. But 
it gave us another step into the digital space by giving us a denture that could be produced faster and more efficiently and would fit really nice, uh, but just not have the permanency and quality that we like. So these became uh, temporary dentures or trial dentures um, until we moved into generation two, which is where we are now. So uh, for three years now, and this was released last year, uh, this material is from Dent Supply. It's called Lucitone Digital Print. And it is the only generation two material on the market right now. And the exciting thing about the Lucitone Digital Print is that it is stronger than what we use today. And as you can see in the middle picture, it is, if not as a Aesthetic, more aesthetic than what we do today. So no materials, no strength, uh, added strength with the new resin and with uh, blending it with a, a company called Carbon, with, which is the leading 3D printer in the dentistry field today. Uh, they are in other industries as well, but the printer is very cool. Then labs really have gotten the benefit of this uh, to pass on to you in a big, big way, because this printer can print eight to 12 dentures in about two hours. And the lab can assemble the denture, polish it up and have it ready. And probably one to two hours after that. So it's very fast. Uh, and it is again, materials that we're familiar with. So, you know, that's where we are digitally and coming back around to, you know, your world, you know, can we do a digital denture that we can predict? And, and yes, we can. We have to kind of merge it with some analog technology like impressions and bites. But we take a case like this where obviously it's a, a, a denture patient in need that uh, needed the support and, of course, needed the teeth again. So we took traditional impressions, used a face bow, used a, um, we did a tracing uh, to get the occlusion, and we also did a uh, a bite registration, which is the bottom picture uh, attached to the face bow so that we could transfer our vertical to the digital space, which is what we did, right? So you see the denture upper and lower designed on the screen. And from that design, we printed the bottom picture with a, um, a monolithic try-in. And this is a resin that the patient can actually wear for a few days to a few weeks. It's not a permanent solution, but what it gives us is a whole new ball game when it comes to try-ins, right? This is a functional try-in, a, a try-in the patient can eat with and, and go through their day with. And, and it is monolithic, it comes in multiple shades, Vita shades, but uh, it gives us a lot more information than this, the traditional wax up. And so what this uh, digitally created try-in and printed try-in gives you the dentist an opportunity is to say, hey, here's your test drive denture, take it home, come back and tell me if it doesn't feel right, if it feels high, and you can make adjustments on this try-in denture simply by taking a burr to it or uh, relining it with an impression wash or adding composite to it and then send that modified try-in back to the laboratory who can then rescan it, re-enter it into their software and fabricate the final denture virtually from your changes and deliver it. So we cut down on appointments, we improve the accuracy and with materials like a loose stone digital print, we provide a really, really high end product. And one that, you know, if the patient needs replacing it next week, we can easily do that as well. So, when we have that kind of technology to back us, right, uh, then we move into the implant world thinking, oh, this is pretty exciting. Can we merge these two together? And so let's talk about implants and edentulous patients today. Um, and, and we'll talk about first options. And, and I believe that in the dental office, having options is critical, right? I don't think there's one solution for every patient or one practice. I think it's nice to have the options and then what we're going to talk about today is you know what's the thought process to go through these options and try to decide which method of treatment is the best for this particular patient so i do believe it's all about options and uh, if we have a, an edentulous patient in the chair you know what are our choices what are our options well of course we can still make traditional dentures right we, we we've done it every day we now have a better way to do it with the cad cam and the carbon printers but it's a traditional denture and we certainly know how to do that it can continue to do that we're here today to talk about implants though so what are the other options there well the first one that's probably the most popular it probably accounts for well over half of the implant dentures made and that's the over dentures 
And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is the fixed solution, which we hear more and more about. And we're seeing dental offices opening up around the country that focus on these teeth in a day thing. So the fixed solution or the all on next solution is uh, the other end of the spectrum. But we're also going to talk about today uh, primarily is this third solution, which a lot of folks still uh, haven't seen yet. It's been out for several years, but I think it's a great option to add to your tool bag as you're talking to the patient about you know what can we do here so let's talk about them one at a time we won't spend a ton of time on um, uh, the the removable option but just to give you know an overview that a removable full arch implant restoration is basically a denture with some sort of attachment in it that attaches to either implants directly or to a bar that connects implants and the most common of these of course is the locator denture right the two locators in the lower cuspid bicuspid position and the denture snaps on. So one thing to remember about a full arch removable over denture like one of these, that this is a tissue borne appliance. Uh, it is not an implant, implant borne, it is implant supported, but not implant borne. So we do still see uh, ridge loss uh, in the posterior. Uh, we, we still see, you know, tissue, situations and, and, and bone situations with these kind of appliances. But what they do is they give that patient who might have been wearing a lower denture for a long time, the ability to have an appliance that feels more stable in the mouth and gives them a little bit more confidence in chewing and, and the fact that it will stay in better. But it is still a, uh, a, a tissue borne but implant supported appliance. That, that come, becomes important later. The other end of the spectrum would be the fixed solution. Now, this is a solution that uh, we call it all on X. Uh, that, of course, Brad and Mark brought to the, the industry some years ago and has been wildly successful. And it, and it is a good solution for some patients, right? Typically for implants, um, you see more and more uh, uh, surgeons or periodontists or, or GPs that place implants putting five or six, right? Why do we not do um, all on four every time because all on three is a loser, right? We can't, we can't support a restoration with three implants. So some folks are now putting five or six in as just sort of a safety net backup, but it's typically two implants near the front, two implants near the back that are angled and some sort of abutment system is screwed to that. And then the appliance is screwed to the top of that as well. So the appliance could be one of many things and we'll talk about a few options, but these are appliances that are bolted in by you and they stay in unless you take them out. So to the patient, you know, this is for that patient who says, you know, I, I want teeth again. I don't, I don't want something I have to take out of my mouth every night. I want to feel like I felt when I had teeth. And so that this is the conversation to have is it, it is the all on X solution for those type patients. Uh, very successful and certainly wildly done. And today we're going to add a third uh, option to the mix and we call it full arch but fixed and removable. And this is the Kona solution. So we had the um, locator type overdenture on the left that's a tissue borne implant supported. We have the all on X on the right that is a totally implant supported, right? It feels like teeth because whatever restoration we bolt to those implants, it is a fixed solution and totally implant borne. The one in the middle, kind of gives us the best of both worlds, right? The implant restoration rides on the implants. This is an implant borne appliance. So to the patient, it feels fixed, but it's removable and uh, we need them to remove it. So for cleansability and whatnot. So we'll talk about the benefits, but it's a great third option. So how do you start? Where, where do you say, okay, I got a patient, a chair, good edentulous ridges. Uh, they've asked about implants. You know, how do, how do we start? How do we make the decision? Well, I always start with the patient. I always ask the patient, tell me, um, you know, what your goals are. What is it that you have now that you do like or that you don't like, right? And so we start there because a lot of times you'll have, you know, a, an elderly patient in a chair that might have been wearing a lower denture for a long time. And all she says is like my grandmother said, I just want my denture to quit moving around so much. You know, that's a pretty good locator type conversation, right? If all we need is stability and they don't really mind the denture, then a locator is a good option. If somebody says I want teeth again, then of course we're going to have the, the fixed conversation. 
Price and values is always right. We, is a topic we have to talk about because it's usually the first or second questions our patients ask us. So we have to be prepared for that. Um, can we put the implants where we want to put them for what we want to do? And can we put the number of implants that we need? So let me back up a second. Look at this picture here. This was an all on four case and a pretty successful case, right? Aesthetically, a uh, small line, uh, size alleged, everything turned out really, really good aesthetically. But the patient came back um, within a year and was dissatisfied with the result. And the reason being was that any time that she smiled any bigger than normal, her upper lip would get caught up above the restoration, in between the restoration and her ridge. And it, it just would get up there and slip in that groove and stop. And so she wasn't happy about that. She had to physically reach up and pull the lip down. And so she said, what can we do? And you know, the, the old lab guy thinks, well, I'll just add some more acrylic up there. But then you kind of take a step back and realize, no, I can't really do that. That's a, a area that she would not be able to clean at all. So you know, what's the challenge here, right? She, she really wanted the all on four. She got it. It functionally, it was great. Uh, but it was not giving her the lip support that she needed. And we really haven't had another option for stuff like that until the conus came along. So, um, other things that we asked patients or try to, you know, understand about patients is, you know, how attached are they that it's fixed or removable? Do they have the dexterity, right? Can they, can they clean under an all all on X, or can they remove a conus or locator easily? Or and maintenance in general, are they going to take care of it, right? And then to the patient's point of view, the cost. And of course, the intraoral limitations, how much room do I have to do what we want to have? So let's talk about some of those. Regardless of the restoration we're doing, we always try to think about on implant-borne devices, um, uh, AP spread, right? AP spread is a, a measurement that we use frequently when we're making a fixed or a fixed removable restoration because we can't put too much torque on the distal of the distal most implants. So we, we draw a line between the anterior implants and the posterior implants. We measure the distance between those lines and we multiply that by one and a half. And that gives us the maximum distance we need to go with the posterior uh, end of the restoration, right? So we have to think about this ahead of time. If we want second molar occlusion, then we have to make sure our implants are placed to support that. The next most common measurement that we look for is uh, the vertical space, right? If we don't have enough room to put everything in, then we're going to have to deal with uh, fractures and pop-offs and things like that. So I get asked quite often, you know, how much space do we need? So what I always measured was from the ridge we were restoring to the occlusal plane, right? And if I had 15 millimeters, you know, I look at this list of potential restorations. If 15 millimeters, which of these do you think I could put in there? It's kind of a trick question because I could put all of them in there, right? At 15 millimeters, there's not much we can't do implant restorative wise. Now, we don't always have 15 millimeters, right? What if we have 12 millimeters? You know, what does our list look like then? Well, we get down to conus locators and maybe some crown and bridge. We kind of lose the ability at 12 millimeters to put a bar or a hybrid type fixed uh, solution in there. What if we get down to nine to 11 millimeters? Well, now we're really running out of room and we're, we're pretty much with locators or some sort of crown and bridge. And of course, less than nine millimeters is not near ideal at all. And it's pretty tough to get anything other than some sort of crown and bridge in there. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't take a patient where we have nine millimeters and say, you know, I want to do a conus case. Well, we just have to figure out how we're going to get those uh, extra three millimeters that we need, right? Are we going to open the bite? We're going to do bone reduction. You know, can we do things like that to get that space we need? So those are, um, you know, a discussion on the options. Let's talk a little bit deeper about each one. Uh, and the overdenture, I'm not going to talk about all the different locator uh, type attachments. We'll just focus on the locators for just a slide or two, because most of you have probably done a locator case. It's pretty common, very popular, and still one of the most widely used attachment systems out there. Um, and these are the reasons why, right? It, it's easy, and it fits in a lot of places, and they make them for most every implant. I will share with you maybe a couple of new things you haven't seen. They do have a, a, a new version of Locator. They call it Locator FTX. I call it Locator 2.0. Uh, 
looks purple on the screen, but it's actually a little more pink. So they've anodized it to help hide it a little better. A little bit more retentive uh, elements to the inside and outside of the cap. So that's a little benefit, but we have to always be aware that um, locator RTX and original locators parts are not interchangeable. So that's it's just a little caution there. The image on the left is a relatively new piece that they don't talk a lot about, but it's one of my favorites out there because of the digital aspect. That is a locator scan cap. So it fits on the locator and, and labs could use it in the, in the lab to, as they scan the model so that they can fabricate their digital denture. And it has just a perfect amount of reduction so that the void in the denture will be the perfect amount of space and with an undercut for the lab to pick up the cap or for the dentist to pick up the cap. Uh, Dennis can also use it chair side to scan with an intraoral scanner. Other things about locators that you may not know, right? There's pretty much every torque wrench company now has a tip for your torque wrench for a locator, which is great for me because I always hated dealing with that uh, gold colored uh, coupling device we had to use with to torque locator abutments in. So get yourself a torque tip that fits a locator. Uh, and what do we use to pick up the caps? We're still using chair side or quick up. Both are great. Both are validated to work with all the acrylics that we're familiar with, including the new uh, printed version. So we, you know, we cut a recess and use one of these materials to pick up the cap chair side for the most part. So not a lot of information on locators. That's a whole nother program, but most of you already know that anyway. Uh, well, a couple of slides on fixed hybrids. Again, the, the types of rest restorations that we can make over uh, an all on X case would be, you know, a, a metal bar that's wrapped in acrylic indenture teeth, a uh, metal bar that has crowns that we submit to it, a solid zirconia piece that's colored, uh, a pecton or peak plastic framework with crowns. The options are endless. The, the end of the day, though, uh, what we're putting them on is the same, regardless of the implant system. Uh, it, everybody has their advantage. And it just, this happens to be the um, smart fix from uh, dense ply implants. I like the abutments. Uh, they've got a really cool delivery system, but it's not unlike what the image we see for the Nobel all on four or the Strauman solution. They're, they're all great. Uh, anybody with any brand name today are, are making good implants and good solutions. So, but we bolt stuff to the top, right? So that's what we're here to talk about is what can we put on top of that? Um, and again, all the all on X pretty much done the same way, right? It's regardless of what system you're using, um, they're all done exactly the same. Now the challenge with the all on X is cleansability. And, and I was naive in the beginning when I started helping restore these. I, I just assumed that if the patient was willing to go through all of this to have this kind of restoration, that they would be diligent about clean, cleaning. And you know, we've all learned over the years that, that patients um, aren't as diligent as we'd like them to be on big cases sometimes. So that's been a challenge, right? And so we, uh, we used to design things that tried to be more anatomical like this one and, you know, assuming the proxy brush would work. But um, we've learned now that we can't do that and we can't do this, right? We have to really make it easy for the patient to clean. And so pretty much every all on X case today, a restorative wise has to be convex underneath so that uh, it, it's easily cleansed like, like this one. But like this one, this was uh, our lady whose lip got stuck, right? Uh, we designed it convex, but it created a place for her lip to fall and, and caused her problems. So, you know, what do we do for that patient, right? She, she wants this type of solution, but we can't have that happening. You know, what do we do? And, and that's where the, uh, the third option comes in. We'll talk about next. Uh, zirconia still very popular for these restorations, uh, whether it's a solid piece like at the top or a two piece where the lab makes a frame and then they make crowns that are cemented in place, which, you know, is a, it may be a better way of thinking because, you know, you won't have to take the whole framework off if, if one of the crowns chip or crack or anything like that. Uh, zirconia is a tough material to handle at that um, in this size when it's that big. So you just have to find a lab like uh, micro that's good at it. These materials, Materials are, are gaining in popularity. Of course, titanium's all around. The one at the bottom is a titanium metal framework with uh, zirconia bridge units that'll be cemented on. That's, uh, I guess you'd call that the un indestructible uh, framework. But the, the top one is uh, Peak or, or Pecton is a brand name. And it is basically a high grade industrial, high strength 
uh, plastic or resin or uh, fiberglass type material. Really, really, really tough. It's, uh, um, it's not impossible to break, but very, very hard to break. But the big advantage uh, to the pecton frames is that their weight. Uh, they are about a fourth of the weight of the titanium or the zirconia. So they're a little more comfortable for patients. Uh, they feel a lot better and we're mostly made as a framework, either a bar that's wrapped in acrylic or a frame like this where we're making crowns to go on top. So that's fixed. That's uh, removable. And we're really here uh, to talk and uh, highlight this one. This is a fixed and removable. And it's been one of my favorites for uh, about eight years now. I was actually doing this before it even became Conus. And it's a concept that, uh, it's called a conometric concept, and it's basically a metal cap that fits on a, a metal abutment for retentive uh, purposes, and it's a telescopic fit. So the retention is great, uh, but what Conus gives us that we did not used to have is uh, a customized angle correction. And uh, these can be made for, for almost any implant on the market today. So it's a very cool system, and what it does is it gives us that uh, full arch, a digital solution that is fixed but yet the patient can remove it for clean, cleansing or whatnot. Here's the history, here's where it came from, right? Uh, Syncone is a product that uh, was with uh, the Ankylos implant system, stock part, there was a straight and an angled. So the doc could order what they needed to you know, correct the implant placement, but because there's only one angle option, it, it wasn't suitable for every case. We couldn't use it everywhere. I had a few surgeons that used it and loved it when we did it, but if the implant uh, angle placement was too less or too great, and we just couldn't do this because the abutments at the end have to be parallel, right? For this to work well, they have to be very parallel. And so it was a little limited uh, because we were limited to where implants could be placed to, to get that angulation correction. But, uh, and you have to have four. When you do a, a conus case, you have to have four. So um, we did them. I did a fair number of them, but uh, I was always uh, desiring that I could do more because of the angulation. Well, when um, Ankylos and Atlantis merged uh, and became part of Dent Supply, the Atlantis engineers and the Syncone engineers got together and say, hey, let's use each other's technology to make this Syncone concept more customizable. And that's exactly what they did. They took all they'd learned about making custom uh, fixed abutments in the Atlantis group and transferred that knowledge over to Conus. And so what they did was they took Syncone and made it customizable angulation wise and they gave it a new name and they called it Conus. Still use the same exact caps that we used back with Syncone. Those are actual Syncone caps. So the cost is not uh, that much and it was pretty exciting to be able to say, okay, we can use the caps we're familiar with, but we now can get our uh, Syncone abutments customized to correct the angle with whatever patient we have. And we can correct angles up to 30 degrees. That's pretty exciting. And so what happens is, you know, the lab's going to uh, design those abutments to fit within the setup, get the angulation correction done and order the stock caps that fit them because the tops are always the same. And so what is the top? It's a, a they call it a conometric concept, but it's basically a, um, a titanium abutment that could be customized to correct angles and a gold alloy housing. Now, the first time I saw it, I thought, wait, wait a minute, gold and titanium, the gold is softer, it's going to wear out, this thing's going to get loose pretty quickly. But if you look at it in the cross section, you'll see that being conometric or being conical, you know, as the cap engages further down the abutment, it actually gets more retentive. And all the studies they've done, uh, they've never seen these things get loose. Um, I've never seen one get loose unless I cut it myself. Uh, they actually get more retentive with age. They, they're actually super retentive. And when you put four in a case, you've got an excellent amount of retention. So it's more retentive than any attachment we've ever used in dentures. And it's more durable than anybody would ever have hoped for. So what are the limitations? How can we use it? Well, of course, there's some vertical space, right? I like to have 12. Ideally, I have 15 vertical. Um, we always have to remember about that millimeter on the left. I call that the magic millimeter. The millimeter on the left, you notice there's a gap around it, right? So that gives that cap 
room to move or to swedge on the abutment. If we have acrylic in that space, invading that magic millimeter space, then the cat can't swedge as well and we don't get the retention. So when somebody calls and says, you know, the, the venture's not staying in like it was when we delivered it, you know, I always look at that first. That's typically the reason there's some acrylic that has invaded that space and we just take a Fisher bird and we kind of remount around the outset of the acrylic, of the housing a little bit in the acrylic. The pictures at the top, notice that I can have a flange or not have a flange. You know, I can design it like an all on X where it's con convex on the bottom. But if like our patient that had the, the lip issue getting stuck, we could put that flange up there to support that for her. But yet the appliance still feels fixed, which is, you know, still a compromise, but a much better compromise than going back to a locator type venture. So the regroup, right? We've got a fixed solution on one end and all on X is a great solution for those patients that want it and are willing to pay for it. Um, and then a removable for, for my grandmother that just wants her denture to be uh, more stable. And now it's nice that you can have a third option, right? It's fixed and removable. So it kind of gains the best of both worlds, which is exciting, right? You can tell the patient, yes, I can make you something that feels like fixed like uh, your teeth again and uh, we can cover up that bone loss. So we can give your lips the support we need and you just have to have uh, the willingness to take it out and clean it every night. So let's go through the workflow to give you an understanding. Um, uh, I, there's a screen coming up that uh, you might wanna take a screenshot of. I'll stop and uh, let you do that. But uh, I'm gonna walk through the workflow a little quick. We, um, we're at 2.39, we got 20 minutes, we got plenty of time. So. Um, the typical appointment that I was doing, uh, our appointment procedure was a four appointment procedure. And, and, I, and I'll take one of those away in a second and show you how it can be a little bit easier, but I'm going to show you why I, I did a, an extra appointment here. So we'll, let's go through the steps, you know, individually. First appointment, you're going to take an impression. You're going to take a fixture level or impression. You're going to take the healing caps off, put your impression post in and take the lab a, an impression. You also uh, should take a bite at this point. So we're kind of after the first, we're not counting the first preliminary appointment. If you needed that, right? If you needed to take a bite at this point, uh, you, you, you would need to take a preliminary impression without impression post to give the lab a chance to make you some bite rims. But if you can take the bite without that, then certainly you can do so pretty easily. So we're picking up right where we're starting the restoration. You know, this is a bite rim that engages a couple of the implants. You don't always have to do that. I just always thought it was a good idea for the dentist to kind of bolt down the bite rim to get a better bite. But so we take an impression, we take a bite, we send that to the lab. So the lab is going to do a setup for try-in and it could be done traditionally or it could be done digitally, right? So if it's done either way, so all they're doing is they're saying, okay, this is a space that we have. I can see where the implants are. So I'm going to set the teeth accordingly and we're going to send it out just to verify that the patient is pleased with where we have the teeth and the occlusion is okay. So what you're gonna get back from the lab in your second appointment is that try-in. Again, it may or may not uh, attach to the implants. It's up to you in the lab. Um, didn't always do that at this point. This is all I really care about the second appointment is to make sure the teeth are in the right position. If I'm doing it uh, digitally and I'm printing a try-in, a set of try-ins, then I'm really not going to engage the implants because, you know, I don't want to run any risk of moving anything or, or affecting the implant uh, osseointegration. But I do want the patient to have the ability to put the dentures in the mouth and feel them a little bit and see how the teeth. But all I'm really looking for, again, is smile line, midline, occlusion. Do we show enough tooth? That type of thing. Once we're happy with that, and, and if we're not happy with what we got, then we either move the teeth in the wax or we adjust the try-in we send that back to the lab. And the lab is now gonna take that try-in and they're gonna build the conus abutments underneath that setup, right? So they can customize it, get it in the position so that we don't have to move the teeth, right? And make sure it fits everything well. So they'll design the abutments, they'll get the abutments ordered, they'll get the caps ordered, they'll seat the caps on. And most labs, and this is where the extra appointment comes in, most of us believe that, um, we need support, especially if you're going to do a open palate on the maxillary and for lowers, you know, we need a little additional strength 
think inside the denture. So I've tried several ways. Most of the cases I end up just uh, waxing this with uh, cast uh, uh, metal, cast partial uh, meshwork and casting it in, in the partial room. So it's just a strengthener. Uh, I think today, if I go back to the lab, I'm probably using that pecton or peak material because it's so much lighter um, and mill out this strengthener. But all this is is a strengthener that I'm gonna send to the doc and ask the dentist to pick up the caps in the mouth to verify the fit. So that's why we have an extra appointment here. And so what will happen is the lab will send you the housings of the caps and ask you to engage them in the mouth, seat the framework over those caps, and then pick those caps up in the framework with crown bridge cement. And you can do that and then pull the framework off and send it back to the lab as it is. Or if the tissues have changed a lot for whatever reason between appointments or, you know, maybe the, the bite changed because your, tr your trying will come as well. Um, you can take another impression at this point. And if you take an impression, then you would want to pull that framework with the caps uh, captured in that new impression. Typically, if everything fits well, you don't need to do this. You just try and verify it and pick up the caps and send it back to the lab. And what the lab's going to do is just put that back on the model and process the denture around it or remount it then jump fit it over if they need to do that. Fourth appointment is delivery. Everything's done and engaged and um, you're good to go. So that's for a lab processed uh, capture where the lab's going to gather the caps in for you. Um, and this is that workflow. So this is that screenshot you might want to grab a screenshot of. So this goes through each appointment, right, of what the doctor does and what the lab does. And it's a pretty simple process. It's uh, pretty easy, uh, but uh, four appointments if we're doing a metal framework. Take just a breath here and see if there's any questions. Nope, we're good. All right, what if we want to do it a little easier? And actually, I'm, I'm starting to get excited about uh, this next technique because it's virtually the same, right? Um, but we're not going to make a framework. And why would we not make a framework? Well, I, I had some dentists that just didn't want to spend the extra on the framework or didn't feel like it was necessary. A little old lady, not a ton of occlusion load. So we took the framework appointment out, right? So now we're back to a three appointment version of the CONUS and makes it a lot simpler. And the reason I get excited about the potential for this is with that uh, printed denture, right? If we have a denture that we can now design and print out of a material that's twice as strong as what we've been using, um, Perhaps we don't even need a metal framework or support for dentures in the future. Now, that's just me speaking. Nobody's validated that yet. But if the, the tests have proven true that the material that uh, the loose tone digital print is two times stronger than loose tone 199. And so I can't wait till somebody validates or does some research to say, you know what? Two times as strong is enough. We don't really need any support in there. So pretty exciting where we're headed. But I did have customers that did this without frames. A lot of the cases we did early on had no frames. And we moved into uh, adding frames as we had some things breaking. So let's go through that procedure and see how that would look, right? So what would happen is that you would get uh, the, the finished denture and it would have uh, access holes in it. And you would put the caps in and you would put these sleeves over and you would be picking up the caps chair side. Uh, just like we do locators. So pretty easy system. Uh, it's treated just like locators, but a little more critical in how we use those uh, spacers, right? The spacers and locators are just to keep things uh, from underneath the locator cap. But this one, we want to take a little extra care to make sure those uh, rubber sleeves are engaged on the cap to protect that magic millimeter we talked about earlier. I'll show you that. Well, here's a graphical image of it. You can see that it has a little skirt so that that last millimeter of that cap is covered by the rubber housing, All right? So this is the procedure. We, we put the cap on, we slip the rubber cap, uh, the gold cap on, we slip the rubber uh, sleeve over it, stretch it over, but make sure we protect that magic millimeter. Uh, ensure that our denture has free and easy access. You, you want the denture to be passive. Uh, it doesn't, shouldn't be touching the cap or, or anything. So there's a cross section of what uh, the white sleeve and the, ha and the housing and the denture underneath. And then 
we inject to pick up material around, right? Take the denture out, clean it up, make sure that our one millimeter, magic millimeter is open and free so that it can be engaged and then uh, deliver the final seat. So these are some of the cuts you've seen. You know, some of them are bigger than others. Uh, you don't need to really make them so huge that you have all, all that space. Uh, you just want to have a passive fit of the denture. You don't want the teeth or the acrylic bumping into it. Again, we pick it up with the same material we pick up locators with, the, the chair side material or the, the VOCO uh, quick up. After we get them picked up, we clean up the inside really good and we deliver the patient to the patient. Now, as a locator case, we're gonna spend a little time with the patient here. We're gonna make sure that they understand how to engage it, right? And how to get it off and they can get it on and off pretty easily. Some patients struggle because this is a lot of retention. This thing is a very retentive device and it feels great in the mouth, they tell me, but um, sometimes they can't get it off easily. So we'll start first by cutting notches in the uh, side of the acrylic to give them a fingernail uh, location so they can pull down or, or push up with their fingernails. I've seen some labs make these little uh, handles, these little hooks that they give to patients to give them more leverage to help pull it off. Um, but we do want to let them put it on and put it off and get a feel for it. Uh, one thing to remember is that uh, coach your patients that, you know, it's not a brute force, you know, pull it off and push it on. When you're, you're taking a conus case out, you kind of want to grab both sides and sort of do a rocking motion uh, left and right. So you kind of wiggle the device off instead of trying to brute force it off. Because remember, it's kind of like two beer glasses, right? This conical connection, this conometric concept. And we've got four of them. And you can't take two wet beer glasses and separate them by pulling straight up. But I can start wobbling the top glass and I can get it off pretty easily. So the same concept here. I've, I've seen a number of patients really struggle getting it off the first time. But then you coach them through that process and they can wiggle it off pretty easily. I always, uh, at the end, started uh, making what I call a sleep denture, right? And I think it's a great idea because not only does it give something to protect the abutments at night uh, when they take their appliance out, but by telling them that here's your sleep denture, it lets them know they have to take it out at night. Remember, these are metal-to-metal -metal cones that if a patient leaves this appliance in, you know, two weeks or more and thinks, okay, I got fixed, it feels fixed, I don't need to take it out, well, because it's conical, the more they chew on it, the more engaged that retention is going to become and the harder it's going to become for them to get it off. So I've seen patients come back to the dental office, you know, after leaving it in for a couple of weeks and say, I can't get it out. And so the dentist had to get in there and figure out how to help pry this thing off. So I love the retention, but we do have to coach our patients that you need to take it out at night, right? You need to take it out at night for a couple of reasons to clean really well, but also so that your caps don't become overly engaged. Uh, how about bridges, short strands? Absolutely, conus is good for that. If you've got a patient that got bone loss, right, and tissue loss, and a fixed uh, bridge is not the right solution, you know, you can get uh, a couple, three conus abutments and make a, a fixed removable solution for patients that have uh, partially edentulous. And one last case showing you a complete digital workflow with conus, right? Here's an immediate case. So uh, the dentist did uh, intraoral scans of this patient right? The, the intraoral scans were imported into the lab computer. The lab software has a unique tool called, tool called virtual extraction. So all the teeth were extracted and the try-in was designed. Printed try-ins were sent to the uh, patient. So next appointment, uh, teeth are extracted uh, and the try-ins were delivered. Now we actually put three little simple ball attachments in the lower to kind of help hold it in. We didn't really load this heavily, right? We took it out of occlusion in two or three spots, but we did want to try to keep the denture a little bit more stable for a couple of days while this tissue healed up. Real typically would not do that. So you can see the virtual try-in. We didn't get the occlusion exactly right, but we adjusted these try-ins and got it down so that when we did our final, we would do better. But the patient was very pleased. Uh, it showed just enough teeth for uh, him. And uh, so we were able to move forward with the case. Right, so what happened is that modified train goes back to the lab, the abutments are designed, uh, the abutments are manufactured, uh, then that information is transferred back over to the setup screen just to confirm that the teeth fit over that 
appropriately. And then the output, right? We sent that design file over to a milling machine and the base was milled out, including the recesses for the housings, right? And the dentures were finished. And in this is the case, uh, the doc wanted the lab to pick up the housings. And so the lab just used a, a typical uh, reline jig to pick up the housings uh, in a pressure pot, right? And delivered to the patient and Great result, right? Implants, uh, caps are coming off. We put the uh, conus abutments in and deliver the final dentures in that glorious shade. Don't you just love the colors that the patients are asking for these days? But uh, we have denture teeth and bleach shades today, so easy to do. But So this is a complete digital workflow start to finish. Pretty exciting. Um, I had one last thing, I promised a bonus, right? And uh, as I go in dental offices, I don't see many of these anymore, right? There's a lot less of physical charts and we see more um, digital charts. But uh, I've done this with many dentists and I can tell you that uh, if you can call 10 patients, you're gonna get at least one or two and I've done as well as 50% as, as, as of the folks we called to, to agree to come in at least talk about an upgrade. And that's the way we have the conversation. You know, we call all our overdenture and locator patients. You know, so it's a good time to do that now and say, you know, just how are you doing with your locator denture? How are you doing with your overdenture? And, you know, start the conversation. Like, you know, I've learned some newer techniques. Some newer techniques have hit the um, dentistry in the last several years, and they've been very successful. And, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, what it gives you is more stability, more like fixed. And uh, this is really an upgrade for a case like yours. And, you know, if you'd like to come in to talk about it, you know, we'll make an appointment, do a consult and not charge you anything to talk about upgrading. And uh, if you have those conversations with 10 locator patients, I can assure you that you will get at least one or two new um, CONUS cases because it is such a they get excited about the fact that uh, it's going to feel like teeth and it's not going to move around as much. Uh, dent supply, you, you can call your dent supply implant rep or uh, your lab and uh, these are free patient ed brochures that kind of walk through the conus and what it means comparing it to locators or, or totally fixed solutions. So it's really well written and it's not commercial at all. I really like that. You can also um, call your lab or your implant rep and, you know, they can provide you with a, a, a demo model. You know, they can make it for you or maybe loan you one for a while to, sh to help show a patient. So have those conversations and you'll absolutely um, get some new cases in your practice. So, all right, we're getting toward the end here. Um, I used to, I, I show this image a lot in the end of my programs and I always uh, end it by saying, you know, I'm not, I don't know what's going on here, but it hit me the other day that, um, you know, it, maybe this is relevant today. You know, maybe this is, uh, what it looks like for the world to try to battle down this COVID-19. Um, and it's true, we're all fighting battles now. It's a challenge for all of us to uh, figure out what to do. But uh, my suggestion is that we all try to be like that guy, right? And uh, let's just sit back and uh, learn as we go and, and try to come out of the gates running with uh, better solutions and uh, better dentists, better technicians, right? So let's jump into, uh, I think I see one question, right? All right, there's questions in the chat. Okay, let me go over to the chat. All right, excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It's well done on the bet. Wow, that's oh, thank you. All right, uh, I'm sorry for looking this way, but I'm gonna scroll through the questions and see. Um, in terms of recording uh, RCP, would you record the bite and then scan the record of the models and the white? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly the way I would handle that, right? So uh, the question relates to, you know, how do you get a digital bite? Uh, you're probably going to take a, a physical bite and then you can scan that with your intraoral camera or send that to the lab and they can scan it and merge it with the model files um, to, to do their setup. Are they making a scan cap for original locators? Yes, uh, it's, uh, I showed it earlier. It's a very cool thing. I think uh, all labs should be using it if they're designing a digital denture over locators. Different types of fixed appliance. Would you suggest one type over the other? I've heard that bar types demand a higher cost and can require um, uh, welding. Yeah, 
Um, when we do a bar, you know, if you do a try-in and with a bar, you, you must always should do a verification step. So it adds another appointment because if the bar doesn't fit, you'll have to cut it and you don't have to do the welding in the mouth, but you'll have to send it back to the lab and I'll have to put a laser welder to it. So with that many impressions and with typical impression procedures, we do see movement distortion and it's tough to get a good accurate passive fit of a bar and they need to be passive. So it is more challenging and that is a more expensive restoration. Um, how hard is it to remove the fixed removal option? Um, it is uh, a little bit more difficult than if it was for lo locators. Uh, it's a pretty rigid, pretty frictional fit. Um, and that's good, but uh, for an elderly patient with minimal dexterity, it can be a challenge. Um, uh, but I love it. But, and, I, and I think it, it just requires some coaching and training on the patient. Um, you can also have fixed removable in terms of the bar and removable denture too, but I've heard these are very costly. Yeah, that's the way we first started making implant removal restorations, right? Early on, everybody felt like you needed to connect all the implants with the bar to stabilize them and to give them better long term uh, stability. So we made a bar and then we put maybe a hater bar attachment in the front end of that bar and a couple of uh, ERA attachments off the distal of the bar for the retentive. And you absolutely can do that. Um, people are doing that with uh, locators today where they're uh, welding or um, screwing in locator attachments on the top of bars. And that certainly gives you uh, the fixed feel to some degree. But remember, locators and haters and all those attachments are resilient attachments. So they move a little bit, which means it's not a totally implant born. It still has mobility. So it's going to be semi-implant born and semi-bar tissue born. So, you know, there's some issues that come along, along with that. Um, uh, excellent, uh, I think you gotta run. All right, um, it is now 2.58, two minutes. Um, I'll step aside now and let Tien jump back in if there's anything else. Um, let me go back one slide. Um, because my email address is in the bottom left-hand corner. And uh, uh, the guys had suggested that, you know, if there are other questions later, if you want to email me or if you just want to reach out, there's my cell number and my um, email address. Take a screenshot, uh, reach out. I'm happy to answer uh, questions as much as I can do to help you in this time. We're all shut in, right? Four weeks I've been um, at home when usually I'm on the road doing this uh, 50 to 80 times a year. So I've had to learn a new skill set too. It's, uh, it's been a joy being with you. And uh, I'll turn it over to Tien now. Thanks, Tien. All right. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending Microdentals CE.